Good afternoon to our viewers in Europe and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol. I'm the president of the American Council on Germany, and I would like to thank you for joining us for today's Café Pause. Each week, we check in with a journalist based in Germany to talk about the news behind the stories. And today, we're making a little bit of an exception because we're joined by Stephen Erlanger, who is currently in Brussels, where he serves as the chief diplomatic correspondent for the New York Times. Steve, it is great to see you, um, particularly since we did not see enough of each other over the weekend at the Munich Security Conference. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to start by thanking you for joining us today, and, and then we can dive in. Great. I'm very glad to do it. Nice to see you. Well, Steve, it is, it is always good to see you. Um, I, I love reading your insights about what's going on, and I know that you have been at a lot of Munich Security Conferences <laughs> over the years. Um, you've got your finger on the pulse of what is going on in Europe and more broadly. And so I thought I'd start by asking you to share with us just some of your main takeaways from this year's MSC. Well, it's always a carnival of a kind. It's a little before Mardi Gras, but it has the same feel. Only people are in suits and ties mostly. Um, it's a strange place. I mean, everybody loves it. It's in a hotel that's much too small. And, but, you know, you bump into all kinds of interesting people that you'd be very hard pressed to get on the phone normally. Um, and you see people from everywhere. One of the best parts is a lot of American congressmen come. They almost never come to Europe. I mean, this is something John McCain started and it keeps the transatlantic hold on this conference which is becoming more as i say of a circus sometimes um so my main takeaway was really interesting i thought which you know is obviously all about ukraine or a lot about ukraine even china was about ukraine but i was very struck by the contrast or even the dissonance between the people on stage who were pamphleteering in a very high-handed moral way about the Ukraine war and the anxiety of everyone in the corridors speaking not for public about how the war is going and how long it's going to last and how much it will cost and is there enough ammunition and can everybody hold together and will China help the Russians and what's in Putin's brain and, you know, what does it mean to win and what does it mean to lose? And, and you know, these are not just the questions that everybody has. These are the questions that our supposed policymakers have. But on stage, you know, you had the feeling that, you, you know, we were on a crusade for the good against the evil and it was all going swimmingly and, um, you know, uh, Putin was about to collapse somehow. I was also very struck by the impact of, of the very powerful and eloquent um, leaders of Central Europe and especially the Balts. Um, obviously, the conference is trying very hard to get more women moderators and more women panelists, which is all to the good. Um, but, you know, I must say Kaya Kallas from Estonia must have been on, felt like a hundred panels. I know it was only four or three. Mm -hmm. And Sana Marin from Finland, you know, was on a bunch of panels. When in fact, her president, who actually is in charge of foreign policy, Sauli, Sauli Ninista, was also in Munich, but you barely saw him. Yeah. So, I mean, sometimes it, it just felt very, very odd. And then there were the, you know, important set pieces, the Schultz speech and the Macron speech. A lot of interest that the two of them were not on stage together. There was a feeling that they did not want to do that um, for whatever reason. I think we can talk about that. And of course, you know, Wang Yi, the um, Chinese, essentially the foreign minister. And of course, this year, under Christoph Hoiskin, I mean, there were no Russians, no Iranians. I mean, I mean, it it felt a little less of an open place, I have to say. Mm -hmm. um, everyone was very proud that they didn't have to hear Sergei Lavrov say what Sergei Lavrov says. But frankly, I 
missed having that kind of presence there. It was great to have Russian opposition there. That was mm -hmm. wonderful and so on. But, um, you know, you see Lavrov in the corridors too. I mean, it's possible to have conversations with these people and they were there this time. Mm -hmm. And the only other thing I would say is that Kamala Harris gave a pretty good speech. She really did. It was moving um, and it was very well crafted. It was delivered very well, but she really annoyed people, not her fault, by her immense motorcade that held people up locked into the hotel for nearly 50 minutes, unable to get out, unable to get in, waiting for the vice president of the United States to drive up in this massive motorcade. And, you know, it just, it's, it's just a terrible sign. There are a lot of leaders there that have security issues and um, one doesn't want to lose a vice president, but there must be some more efficient way of getting her into the building. I'll leave it there. Well, that's that's. Thank you, Steve. Thanks for for sort of setting the stage for us. And I think you know you touched on a couple things that are important for people to hear who who haven't experienced it themselves, right? I mean, you said this this event is is way too big for the size of the hotel that it takes place in, and so you know it's it's very compressed which has the disadvantage of, you know, crawling all over people. And I have to say that there were a couple times when I experienced what you were talking about with Vice President Harris, just because the American delegation was walking through, um, that they sort of cut off two sides of the lobby area because Secretary of State Blinken was coming through. And they blocked and heard, the elevators. No one else can use the elevators. Exactly. And, and the people around me were sort of, da sind die Amerikaner schon wieder, right? Yeah, That's the Americans mistake. yet again, and, and they were complaining about that. Um, but as you say, one of the great things about this conference is um, one has the opportunity to, to see a lot of people on the sidelines. Um, and I guess, you know, the big the big difference for me was, was last year, um, there seemed to be a lot of, th there was even more of a carnival atmosphere because people hadn't seen each other for a year because of the pandemic. And so it was a little bit like a college reunion of, you know, people being excited to get together, uh, but it took place under the cloud of what happens in Ukraine um, and what's the proportional response. Last year, people were also talking about sort of an exit ramp for Putin. And this year, it seemed to me that, you know, obviously, as you say, from the stage, there was this sort of strong show of solidarity as we come up to the one year mark in the war, um, but also real concern about what happens next. And it seemed to me that there wasn't really a clear message about what victory looks like um, for Ukraine and what sort of the end game is. Um, I didn't really hear much of that either from the main stage or on the sidelines, but very much concern about what happens next? What 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 was sort of your your sense of that? Well, I tried to follow it very carefully anyway, you know. And the reason we don't know what the end game is is because we don't know what the end game is. I mean, and there's people disagree about what the end game is and mm -hmm. what's possible, right? I mean, the thing I came away with was a senior Ukrainian official saying to me a la Cote, you know, on the side, we cannot win a long war. Now, that I thought was quite honest and true, but long could be two years or three years. I mean, when people talk about driving the Russians out this year, I think they're living in La La Land. I mean, that's just not how I see the war going. Um, and then, of course, there are people, I understand them, particularly from the countries that were under Soviet occupation, whose parents or grandparents were deported, and, you know, who have real raw and very recent memories of what it is to be under the Soviet thumb, mm -hmm. um, let alone the degradation of intellectual life under occupation, um, who think this is the time to really defeat Russia, whatever that means, and make it clear to the Russians that this imperial game is over, right? 
But then you ask someone, I, I don't, you know, I once joked with Kaya Kalas, who's the very intelligent um, Prime Minister of Estonia, well, what are you going to do? Drive an Estonian tank to Moscow and bring him to The Hague? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you know, there's a, there's a quality of, uh, of rhetorical unreality that feels very good. It's very deeply felt. And then you have, you know, other countries, not just France and Germany, but Spain and Italy, right, who are farther away from the problem, um, who just want to get it over with. Mm -hmm. I mean, they don't want Putin to win, but it's costing them a lot. Mm -hmm. And it will cost them a lot for a, a whole a whole generation. And there are other issues, climate change, blah, blah, blah. But I was also very struck by the change in Emmanuel Macron here. I mean, you can feel it happening, but this was not a Macron who was urging talks right away with Putin. This was not a Macron who was saying, we need to give Russia security guarantees, which he mm -hmm. said before. Mm -hmm. This was a Macron who was saying in a way something obvious, which is what the Norwegian prime minister also said to me is, you know, you can't just take a scissors and cut a big country out of the map if it pleases you to do so. Yeah. It's there. Russia's there. Russia will be there. Russia will be there with Putin, after Putin. And so Macron is right. There has to be some kind of relationship built with Russia afterwards. But he's he's very much now stressing afterwards, which he didn't do before. So I, I think that marked a very interesting change to me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this this you know notion of building a relationship with Russia afterwards, um, the whole notion of reconstruction, both of Ukraine but also of Russia, was a topic that that I heard come up over and over again. Um, and since you you touched on it, you know this this question of of time, um, the Ukrainian official that said to you, "We cannot win a long war." I heard you know from many circles um, the sense of we need a decisive end to this war this year. Um, some people were even saying by this summer, um, because Ukraine simply cannot afford, and I'm not talking about financial terms, but simply cannot afford for this to be an ongoing war. Um, and there is tremendous concern about how long the solidarity of the West will hold. And so you know, one of the the questions I have for you is this this notion of solidarity. I mean, of course, there were was a record number of of members of Congress who were in Munich this year uh, at some of the events that I was at. They talked about how strong the solidarity was, um, and yet I still heard people saying, you know, how long will America support this? There's an election on the horizon. Um, there will be navel gazing in the U.S. People will turn away. W what what did you pick up in that regard? Well, there, there, there's always that. I mean, after all, Europe is still under post-traumatic stress. We should call it post-Trumpatic stress. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they know how old Biden is and they value Biden. And, you know, um, the U.S., after the fiasco of Afghanistan, which really made Europe wonder what the hell was going on, um, you know, the U.S. has done very well with this war. Joe Biden and his team have marshaled the allies, guided the war, guided the sanction program, spoken all the time to their allies, sort of held it together. And actually, let's be fair, despite all the language about as long as it takes and giving them whatever they want, we're not giving them whatever they want. We're carefully calibrating weapons. Maybe we're too slow about it. But Joe Biden has what Schultz and Macron also have, which is a very strong commitment not to get into a war with Russia. And they don't want the Ukrainians hitting the Russians, and they don't want them hitting Crimea very much either, which may be a mistake. But, you know, in a way, we're told the Ukrainians fight this war with your arm tied behind your back mm -hmm. because Russia can attack you, but you can't attack Russia. Um, so it's, it's you know, it's all very complicated. Yeah, I don't think we're anywhere near pushing Russia out by the end of the summer, let alone 
by the end of the year. I mean, my sense of what they're trying to do, particularly with the Pentagon, is organize the Ukrainians with these new tanks, of which there are not enough, mm -hmm. um, with the training, with to the training to have an actually organized maneuver on the battlefield that will involve missiles and artillery and tanks and even aircraft in a coordinated attack which hasn't been done to try to change the situation on the ground enough mm -hmm. to at least cause some russian panic or try to convince putin that the war is unwinnable now i think that's a, by itself is a very ambitious goal Mm -hmm. But that seems to be where we're headed, this famous end of March, early April Ukrainian offensive. Um, so, you know, worries over ammunition supplies, to be sure, there's enough for that. But, you know, everybody's been very slow. And once these hundred tanks, if there are a hundred Western tanks that go in, in six weeks, maybe there'll be 60 tanks because they break down or they get hit. And then there'll be 30 tanks. And what's coming behind those tanks? Who's building tanks? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, the, these are real questions that have to do with the sustainability of the war on our side, not just on the Ukrainian side. So there is a bigger sense of urgency. There's no question uh, before the Russians dig in further. Mm -hmm. One of our viewers just um, asked a question exactly about this. Um, he's he's curious how serious um, the risk is that Ukraine um, is likely to run out of, of ammunition and that that would impact its ability to carry out the war. Do you have any well, sense? It's a good question. I mean, I don't think they're running out of ammunition. Um, what we want them to do is use the ammunition they have more efficiently. Right. Nobody wants to shoot a million dollar rocket at a ten thousand dollar drone right right um just firing artillery at one another isn't a very efficient use of artillery um so you know the russians have always had more ammunition and more shells and will continue to um but so far i think it's okay the worry is by the end of the year we'd better get making stuff faster mm -hmm. um at least i reported a month or more ago that um at the height of the war the russians were firing five six thousand shells a day america makes five thousand shells a month right so i mean this is maybe two days worth of ukrainian artillery fire right. so so this is the worry the other worry which is real is the ukrainians have a lot of t-72 tanks a lot of soviet tanks they take different ammunition mm -hmm. they don't have much ammunition for the t-72 tanks because russia's not going to give it to them right and we've been scouring the world to buy it the Indians don't want to get involved, at least not publicly. Um, so we've been talking to other countries that have it, and we're trying to get factories in Bulgaria and Slovakia that used to make Soviet caliber ammunition to start up again. And, and the Germans have been very active in trying to in trying to make that happen. So it's a bit of a race, but it's not yet that kind of existential race. Mm -hmm. So, Steve, I'd like to sort of spend a couple of minutes talking about about our other sort of adversaries, if you will, and and kind of the tenor mm, around ourselves. that. At, <laughs> at at the at the conference, I mean, you noted that um, Russia and R Iran were not represented at the conference, um, and there was really, you know, some criticism of that from some corners because the the Munich Security Conference has often been a place where. Um, frank off the record conversations could take place um and and this year of course that was not possible i mean i'd agree with you i don't think many people really wanted to hear the standard lavrov speech um but there could have been some opportunities for some bilateral dialogue and that was not that was not the case um do you think that that's something that was that that, that was sort of a missed opportunity 
uh, this year to not include them, or, or do you? Think well, it's it hard sense? to know. I mean, I mean, part of the problem is relations with Russia are so bad, and Lavrov himself is so irrelevant to Russian policy that I think even bilats he he wouldn't be able to say anything very interesting. Yeah, that's my sense of things. I mean, the Russian foreign ministry is basically out of the game. We can get, you know, the head of the Wagner Group to Munich and have a conversation that would be interesting though he's probably on, i'm sure he's on sanctions lists yeah. um iran's different though i mean i i you know yes there are big demonstrations in iran but we still have a nuclear issue there's still the jcpoa there are all kinds of um, um problems in syria with the earthquake with lots of other reasons and I would have liked, actually, I mean, I could see the point on Lavrov. I mean, if, if you couldn't get Putin, which wasn't going to happen. But on Iran, I would have liked Iranians there, to be honest. Okay. Um, and there was an effort, the, the other thing I would say, there was a bit of an effort to talk about what we, I guess we have to call the global south, though some of it's north right. and west and east. Um, um, there were nods made to it mm -hmm. by politicians, just the way there were nods made to ammunition supplies. I mean, there was a lot of rhetoric about we must do this and we should yeah. do that. But um, I think the conference did try. I had a very interesting conversation with um, um, Mr. Santos, who is the former president of Colombia, who won a Nobel Peace Prize in 2016 for trying to negotiate with FARC. And he was very blunt, which we put into the paper, basically saying, you know, the global south isn't really interested. Yeah. And it feels like Ukraine's sucking all the air out of the world. There are more 100 conflicts in the world. And people are interested in more food and lower energy prices. And um, there is a lot of work to be done. Um, and there's a degree of hypocrisy, he said, um, where... The West is is talking constantly about the UN Charter and how Russia is violating, which of course it is, and it's a member of the Security Council, and that's really awful. But on other issues, and he raised Israeli settlement activity, ongoing and occupied land, big powers are silent. Now, again, on some level rhetoric, but on some level he put his finger on just the sense that this is feels like to a lot of the world, uh, a regional war, not a war of values and civilization and so on. Um, and, you know, I think that was an interesting thought. Yeah, I mean, I think, you. so I, I read the piece that you wrote um, following your conversation with Juan Santos, and it's interesting because, um, as as you say, you know, he he was talking about how this conflict is drawing attention away from how many other conflicts there are, from some other big issues um, related to food security, related related to higher prices and inflation, and um, climate, you said, and climate. I mean, particularly coming on the heels of the pandemic, where there are a lot of countries that are seeing um, climate related and supply chain related issues that are affecting food supply, but also affecting costs. And that of course is leading to, to social difficulties, social unrest um, as, as well. And so that sense is, is very much one that I can understand. Um, certainly in some of the conversations I was privy to, um, there, there was that nod to the global South um, and very much sort of a sense that, the United States and Europe also need to provide an alternative to China um, because China is making some overtures to some of these countries in the developing world um, and seems to be scoring points there. And so I did want to talk to you a little bit about Wang Yi's speech um, because he, you know, really seemed to be, you know, trying to drive a, a new wedge between, between Europe and the U.S. Um, there was some discussion that, um, President Xi would soon be presenting a peace proposal to this for this conflict, but at the same time, we've been seeing in the U.S. media that there are concerns that Beijing might start supplying weapons to to Moscow. Um, so, what's what's sort of your read on on 
a china's sort of presentation at the munich security conference but also just china's position at the moment it's really complicated to be sure partly because i think china finds itself pulled into a conflict it didn't expect i mean they were assured by vladimir putin it would be quick and dirty and would be over and then they saw parallels to taiwan that pleased them and the whole idea of having another ally in the chinese struggle against what they consider to be a u.s dominated multilateral world order um, that was very attractive to them Mm -hmm. And Xi Jinping has been very open about this, um, that these are your rules, not necessarily our rules, and we want to reshape the international system because we have the numbers and the power. So I found Wang Yi, his speech was in a way to me very odd because, I mean, it was part of this balloon hysteria. Right. Right. I mean, a lot of hollow balloon stuff going on. And so he was very contemptuous about the US response, which I thought was, you know, meant to be offensive to American officials and was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, you know, they persist in denying that this balloon was anything other than innocent, fine, which, which nobody really believes. But it was also weird, I have to say, to have Americans firing these expensive missiles at other things flying in the air that we didn't even know what they were. They were. Yeah. Very bizarre, I thought. Yeah. Um, so there was that. And I think that together with Tony Blinken's warning that the Chinese were, con were contemplating giving more aid to Russia, I think that undercut his charm offensive. I mean, no European leader, official I spoke to was terribly charmed. Um, they also, you know, even before the war, Europe doesn't want to be the co-pilot in the American fighter jet aimed at aimed at at Beijing. I mean, they see Beijing not as their peer rival as the Americans do but as an increasingly troublesome uh, big country, but is still a very important trade partner. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it is different. I mean, there's more worry about Chinese espionage and, and, and the way China is trying to manipulate the world system. There's no question that the Europeans are not naive about China, but their interests are different than American interests. Um, yeah. So I think that's that's really part of it. I was very intrigued by Blinken, again, using some sort of more open American intelligence about China's intentions, because clearly, you know, I'm sure, I mean, China's supplying low-level chips and different things, and they're certainly buying an awful lot of oil, right, despite sanctions and so on mm -hmm. and so on. But... I think Russia really wants ammo and missiles, and that would be very important because we're trying to attrit the Russian army. That's part of our strategy, as well as Russia trying to attrit the Ukrainian army. And if suddenly China is supplying the Russian military with this stuff, that can change the war. So I, I think there is a lot of real anxiety. And of course, Wang Yi is today in Moscow. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, of Russia, just a little bit more, I mean, what do you make of, of this breaking news that, that Putin announced that Russia would pull back from uh, the New START treaty, which is the, the last um, nuclear arms control agreement with the United States? Well, I don't think it means very much right now. I mean, I think it's sad. Mm -hmm. I think Putin had to announce something. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. had already said a few weeks ago that Russia had stopped complying with the new start. It, it had stopped allowing American inspectors. So in a sense, like with the INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Treaty, which Russia basically ignored, um, if it's suspended, it could be a dead letter. I mean, mm -hmm. everyone was 
very worried about extending it anyway. Um, so it is, it's a more dangerous world. There's no question about it. And, and the mistrust between Washington and Moscow is quite severe. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's very worrisome. And, um, I was also very struck that when Biden went to Kiev, that they gave Russia a call to let them know that he was coming to make sure that, that there was no missiles on, on Kiev. So clearly we have ways to talk to them. Um, that won't stop. But I think, you know, we have now a new iron curtain that's fallen across Europe, but in a different place. Yeah. And I think it's a generational problem. I mean, and it may outlast Mr. Putin too. Yeah, yeah. So since you know the the conference took place in in Germany, um, and and since we are the American Council on Germany, I'd yes, like exactly. to ask um, also about sort of what you heard related to the Zeitenwende and sort of. Germany's response um, to the the war and, and the fundamental policy shifts that were announced, um, you know, almost exactly a year ago in the immediate aftermath of of the the current invasion. Well, I cut Schultz some space, maybe more than others do. I mean, he was a labor lawyer from Hamburg. He was an old lefty as a kid, you know. Um, they have a coalition agreement, which your listeners know is pretty serious in Germany. You know, it's kind of a law, but what they're going to do. And that was all about other matters that got thrown out the window. He has a coalition that was a bit of a surprise, you know, had Laschet not run, had Söder run, had Habeck run, <laughs> might have had a different government altogether. Exactly. Who the hell knows, right? Um, and... I think his biggest mistake was to announce the Zeitenwende and leave Christine Lombrecht in the job, mm -hmm. right? Because I think a, a year really did get wasted. And they could have gotten Rhein Metall to start fixing those old tanks a year ago, even for the German army, because the yeah. Zeitenwende was supposed to be about the German army, right. not about Ukraine necessarily. Um, I think there's been a little loss of, of momentum once. Germans realized the war wasn't coming to them, but was staying inside Ukraine, right? I mean, the anxiety, the fear of the first months, I think, has passed. I mean, there's still neuralgia. I mean, the Germans are more neuralgic for whatever reason about a nuclear bomb than most countries are. Um, and I suspect there's more of a feeling going back to the old rocket debates, I think, you and I talked about this once, mm -hmm. where the Germans felt they would be the first victims of a superpower war fought over their heads. Mm -hmm. And part of the Russian narrative, which gets some grip in Germany and in Europe, is that this is really a Russia-US proxy war. Right. Um, so I think he's handled it pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, I don't blame him for getting cover from the Americans once he got cover from Biden for the martyrs, these armored personnel infantry. carriers, basically armored infantry. It was inevitable he was going to need the same cover for the tanks. Are you kidding me? Anyone who thought otherwise wasn't thinking. Um, and he was very conscious, I think, thinking of Russia and Putin, that it was a German decision to allow leopards from any country to go into Ukraine. So it was very personal. So to get cover from Biden uh, was important to Schultz. I don't blame him for doing it. I think Biden was very statesmanlike to push the Pentagon into doing it, which the Pentagon didn't want to do. Um, the Americans are angry about it, fine, but um, I don't think you know, they understood his position very, very well. Look, there's a lot more that needs to be done. I mean, we know the German military is a mess. Um, and um, we know they don't have equipment. And, and we know the bureaucracy is very difficult to buy weapons. But the Germans are now saying, you know, all those countries that 
push them to free the leopards are now having their own problems. Mm -hmm. They're not providing many or the ones they have aren't in good repair or they don't know how to train people. I mean, even, you know, on these older leopards that nobody uses really much anymore, it's hard to find people to train Ukrainians on them. They've got to bring retirees in. Right. So it's complicated. I mean, maintenance is complicated. So anyway, I mean, I understand the criticism, um, but I think the Germans have provided in real terms the third largest amount of military aid to Ukraine. And when you consider this is a country that never was able or willing to give weapons to any combatant country in the past, um, this is a big change. Um, mm -hmm. And I think it's a big psychological change. And it's very, very complicated mm -hmm. for the Germans. So, so related to this, one of our, our viewers is curious whether um, some of the, the domestic German political tensions were on display at the MSC. Um, I mean, the, the conference took place a week after the Social Democrats did very poorly um, in a state election in, in Berlin. Um, we've been seeing in the German press some tensions between Robert Habeck, the economics minister, and Christian Lindner, the finance minister, sort of play out. Um, how, I, I, I guess, what's your take on some of the, the you know, internal um, irritations within the the government, but then more broadly, um, you know, this sort of sense of solidarity that we've seen um, across Europe and, and with the U.S., but also domestically in, in Germany, do you think that uh, the German public will continue to support German efforts to support Ukraine moving forward? Well, I'm not a prophet, so I don't really know. And on the internal stuff, you'd provide a better answer than me, probably. There's bound to be tension in this coalition, right? As I mm -hmm. said, it was built for a different mm -hmm. atmosphere, for a different world. Um, and it's been a shock to everyone. Um, and I do think part of what drives Schultz, certainly Wolfgang Schmidt, his chief aide, talks about this constantly, is the need to bring Germans along with them to get involved with the war. And that's very delicate because, you know, someone said to me, and I think it's really true, it's a three-party coalition, but in some ways it's a five-party coalition mm -hmm. because there's a very strong, you know, Fundi wing inside the Greens and there's a very strong peace wing inside the SPD. And everybody has to somehow be satisfied. It's very difficult. Um, I mean, Germany is a great real democracy, but democracies are complicated. Mm -hmm. So the fact that there's internal struggle is hardly a surprise. I mean, obviously the chancery is kind of trying to run things. Baerbock gets up their nose sometimes, though mm -hmm. she presents policy very well. Um, Lindner, you know, has a party that, you know, not too long ago wasn't even making parliament. Mm -hmm. So he's got things to prove. Um, Habeck has done an extraordinary uh, adaptable effort for a green, you know, I mean, basically cutting against his deepest held beliefs for the national interest during the war. So that there's bound to be conflict and difficulty, and it's very hard to explain all this to ordinary people who, even before the war, were paying some of the highest energy prices yeah. in the world. Yeah. And now, you know, it's quite extraordinary. Um, it's a rich country, that's for sure. Yeah. But when you think that this assumptions for years that Russia would provide cheap energy and China would provide an easy market, and I mean, the whole economic model is certainly in question. I mean, Germany is a rich country, it will do fine. And I'm sure once the war ends, it will have a lot to do with Ukrainian reconstruction. Certainly. But, but um, this is a big blow mentally to the Weltanschauung, to everything. And it calls in, in 
into question a lot of assumptions that Angela Merkel seemed to live with for 13 years. So yeah, it's, it's certainly we it's a moment. It is it is it is a moment. Um it's a it's a big moment. And I think um, you know, you you spoke a little bit earlier about the German coalition agreement. Um, of course, when this when this new government formed and came together, it was clear that there was going to be a steep learning curve for this government. But they had a very different agenda, which was um, then very quickly overshadowed by the war and where they've had to focus on a, a whole set of new issues. Uh, and I would actually agree with you um, in many senses that that people like Robert Habeck and Annalena Baerbock have been incredibly pragmatic in how they've tried to approach some of these challenges um, and not gotten sort of hung up in, in party um, ideology, but really looked at, at the problems at hand and, and how best to try to address them. Um, but one sort of reflection that I have from at least one of the sessions that I was in um, with German Bundestag members from not completely across the spectrum, but there were Social Democrats, Greens, Christian Democrats and and Free Democrats was they they were talking about just how difficult it is to bring the German public along and to sort of make the case that um, it is important for uh, Germany to provide support to Ukraine um, and and where they have sort of shared some concern is um, not that that is going to break away immediately or in the near future but that it's part of the responsibility of politicians to keep reminding the public that there's more at stake in the war in Ukraine than just the future of Ukraine. Well, this is this is where political leadership actually means something. Mm -hmm. And it can have a cost. I mean, voters can punish you for doing the right thing sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and the other thing that kind of bothers me about the German government, which is, you know, maybe nobody's fault, but I mean, it, it has nothing to say to the former DDR. I mean, it's just, it's, you know, it was like the last government. So, you know, there's, when you look at the opinion polls, a lot of the opinion that's skeptical about the war, or more sympathetic to Russian aims, clearly comes from the former East Germany. Mm -hmm. And it's partly because this government doesn't seem very interested in it, doesn't have much to say in it, there's very little representation. Um, it's It seems to me, it's, I've felt this for a long time, this is not a good recipe, but it, it will have bad consequences down mm -hmm. the road. Um, but, you know, I hope I'm wrong. Yeah. Well, Steve Erlanger, I want to thank you once again for, for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, it is indeed a, a complex world um, out there, and, and there's a lot of complexity when it comes to the global response to what's going on around the war in Ukraine. Um, but I, I just want to thank you for sort of giving us your take on, on what you heard and what you saw in Munich over the weekend. And I look forward to talking to you again in the in the not too distant future. Thank you all very, very much. And thank you for your patience too. Not at all. I'm, I'm okay. always delighted to talk with you. So thank you and, uh, and have a good rest of the day. Many thanks to all of our viewers as well for, for tuning in today. Bis bald. <laughs>